Good morning. This is Pastor Jeff Fairley with Faith and Grace Fellowship here in South Kansas City, Greenview, Missouri. Starting just a minute or so early so that those can get the notification and join at uh, 11 o'clock. We start our services here at 1030, but we don't uh, video or record the, uh, the worship service, the song service, etc. And we start just before the prayers and the, uh, and the uh, sermon. So, anyway, praise God. Praise God. Glory to your name. It's a beautiful day outside today. It's a gorgeous day to be here. Sun shining. It's a little crisp. It's about 47 degrees this morning. But still, it's a beautiful day. Our opening scripture comes from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 11 and 12. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and saved, I have proclaimed, and there's no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. He leaves that to us to be his witnesses. Is he God in our lives, or is he just the big pie in the sky is somewhere in the great beyond that maybe he'll uh, he did something in the past and maybe he'll do something in the future but he's nothing to me now I don't want a God like that I want a God that is intimately knowledgeable in my life and my activities and the things that I've got going on and he says that we are his witnesses as we go to the Lord in prayer we need to continue to pray for Rita Hoffman, she's doing great. She's getting around more and more with her, just her cane. She does take her walker when she goes out uh, inside the house just for more stability because the ground's not as stable. Uh, she was she was doing a garage sale there at her place yesterday. So tells me that she's healed and <laughs> back to her old self that she's, she's back to garage sailing. Now, it was a... Uh, she lives in a little villa set up and it was just out at the end of her walkway at a table sitting in a chair and uh, the people came by all the different garage sale pieces they have and so she was having fun I mean she always loved to do a garage sale so she's getting back to normal but still getting her more strength and stability she's needs to get back where she used to be to continue to pray for Kathy she's been having some issues that uh, keep coming up and we're taking authority over these and believing for complete healing for Keith Wilson and family for Lisa and Bob Hunsell my aunt Darlene my aunt Jane still recovering from uh, their situations for Donald Miller he still has to keep going into the hospital because of issues that he has with his uh, his frail body he's less than a year old but he's uh, he's been in the hospital more than most people so pray for him. Pray for mom. Uh, she's healing from various things, and we thank God for that. Uh, yesterday was not an easy day for her. It was the 25th anniversary of her husband, my father, going on to be with Jesus. And so it was a rough day, but we're still here today. We're looking forward to the day we can have that heavenly reunion. We're not getting a bus up today, but soon and very soon we shall see the king. And when we do, we'll get to see dad again. We've got a couple special requests, unspoken. Continue to pray for Rob and Robin Ballinger as God's continuing to work in their lives to heal the things that are going on with them. I thank God for that. I'm encouraged. Pray for my cousin Steve Rippey as uh, we're asking God to continue to heal him. He's gotten through some of the treatments that he's needed to go through or he's getting close to the end of those, but he needs more. My brother Mark, uh, he needs a lot of prayer. There's uh, medical issues going on that he needs help with, so lifting him up. For Sam Crabtree, Sam, you've been asking for prayer for a long time. We've been praying for you each week. Give us a, a notification as to how you're doing. I mean, I get encouraged, and then you talk about uh, how it flares back up. So give me a give me a call. So we're praying for you for continued healing. 
We always pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Psalm 122, 6. As God says to you, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, may they prosper who love you. And we thank God that he watches out for us, but he wants us to pray for what is the apple of his eye. And it says that, that uh, Jerusalem is the apple of his eye. So let's pray for that. Uh, continue to pray for workers of the harvest, the spiritual uh, state of this area, for people needing jobs and or income. Uh, so let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, for not only the city, but the government that is there and all the people that are called by the name of Abraham, that there would be peace in their lives and safety. I pray for the IDF uh, gal that was just killed recently with some gunfire. I pray for her and her family, that Father, you would lift them up and that her life would be a blessing. She gave her life for her country to keep others safe, and I pray for you to continue to bless her family. And Lord, I pray for all to be safe, for you to help them to find these issues before they become anything that can be fruitful. Continue to, to weed out all of the secret things that are coming against them and help them to stop them. And so not just in the country of Israel, but in Ukraine and wherever they may be, the United States, in Europe, wherever your people are. Father, I pray for peace for them and around their home and their families. Lord, I pray for workers for the harvest, people to be lifted up, to raise up and to parent new believers. There are revivals going on. There's one that's ending tonight here in the Kansas City area. There's another that's picking up down in Bates County, there's others that are uh, in California. These are the ones I know about. There are others that are happening. You are moving on your servants, God, to invoke the end time revivals, to get in and to lead people to the Lord. But we need workers to take those people and to, to parent them and to guide them and direct them in how they should walk. And Father, I thank you that you are raising those people up in many churches around the country. But Father, I also pray against the spiritual state of wickedness in this city, in this county, in this state, in this federal region, in our nation, in our government. I bind, according to Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, all that the enemy is trying to do that is not according to the time that you've already written. I've come against the enemy that's coming against the church, that the church be able to thrive and survive. And I pray for a loosening of the, the spirit in the hearts and lives and homes that the church be revived and be ready to explain the, the hope that was within them. Father, I pray for a Holy Spirit revival within the church and it spill out into the cities that people start seeing that God is real and is for today. Gas prices are not the thing that needs to be talked about, but it needs to be the that God is on the throne and that he's the lover of men and he wants men and women to become a part of his family. And Lord, I pray for those needing jobs or needing an income stretch, that Father, you would bless according to your word, that those that are tithers and that those that give, you say that you will prosper them as they are prospering, as, you are, as they are giving, you are prospering them, you'll pour into them what they cannot contain. And we thank you for that. And I pray for those needing better jobs, that you bring those to their doorstep, that they be able to, to find those jobs and to step into them, and they be a blessing for them. I pray for those with a, a set income, that, Father, their outgo would decrease and their income would increase, that they would be able to praise you for the sustenance that you've given them. And Father, I just give you the glory, the honor, and the praise as each one of these names that we've lifted up and these special requests that we've lifted up, I ask you, Father, to heal, to deliver, to set free each and every one of these people, each and every one of these issues and these situations, that you be on the throne and be glorified that these situations are taken care of. And we put them all in your hand, in Jesus' holy name, amen and amen. Praise God. Our offering scripture comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 38. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. 
For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. People like to say, God's a hocus pocus God. You give and he gives. Or you give to get. Or preachers say, send me money and God will bless you. I'm just saying that God's word says that he will not be held, uh, uh, he will not be accountable, that he will stand and he will pay you, he will pay you back for what you've given. You say, how does that work? When you give to God, he opens up the blessings. You read in Malachi, you read in Luke, you read in various places, even in 1 Corinthians, how that God says that he will bless. And as he blesses, it comes from places and opportunities that you couldn't have imagined. Sometimes it has to do with extra income. Sometimes it has to do with a blessing where you were able to go buy something that was gonna cost you X number of dollars and you got such a special deal. And you didn't have to pay all the extra. The blessings come in different ways. It comes in health, it comes in life, it comes in family, it comes in grandkids coming around and enriching your lives. It comes in a lot of ways. But he says he will pour into your bosom. And the bosom, that area of the robe was where they kept their purse. They kept their, their money bag in that area of their garment. And so he's directly talking about here increasing your income, your wealth, your savings, your holdings. We don't know how. I've been tithing for many, many years, and I've seen God do it many, many times. There's been things that I couldn't see how it was going to happen. I prayed about it. I prayed about it. I made sure that I was paying my tithe, and increase happened. If I'd kept the tithe back, it wouldn't have been enough to take care of what happened. It was, it was interesting how it did happen. I'm just my own personal testimony. But God says, you give. And he doesn't just give it to you the way you gave it. But he uses the same measure that he presses it down and packs it in and shakes it. And he gives you more volume than what you gave. God loves a cheerful giver. So as we pray over the offerings today, I want to pray over those offerings and those tithes that have come in and those that are going to come in and for all the gifts and all the giver. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the gifts that have come in. I ask, Father, that that be blessed as we receive it for you, that the ministry of this church will continue and go on, and the things that you want us to do, that would go towards that. And Father, I pray for the givers that you would be a true man of your word and go and bless them, bless the giver abundantly more than they could ask or think. And I give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Each week we make our confession. Pay attention to what we're saying here because you're confessing Jesus as Lord in your life. And that's according to Romans 10. I confess and I declare that this is the word of God. God cannot lie. His word is truth. We accept it. We believe it. We receive it. We live according to grace by faith. The blood of Christ has redeemed us and set us free from sin, sickness, bondage, and separation from God. We are free because of Christ's substitute work on the cross. His substitute work on the cross was for you and for me. He didn't have any sin, but he died and his righteous blood was shed for our unrighteousness. Amen. He substituted himself for us. Today's message is titled Tabernacles. Now, don't turn off now. Don't touch that dial. Don't change that channel. The, I want to talk to you about the Feast of Tabernacles, but I want to show you what that means for us as believers and not just Jewish. I go through the feast, and I go through various things about the Old Testament and God's uh, promises to his people because there is a 
there is a uh, lesson for us to learn in what God was trying to say then that still is true today. So bear with me here and let's go to Exodus chapter 23. Now this is starting in the middle of a thought and I'll explain that here in a little bit. So it starts off with and so you know there's something before it. But this is verse 16. And the feast of harvest, the first fruits of your labors, which you have sown in the field, and the feast of end gathering at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labors from the field. Let us pray. Father, I pray for your anointing on this message today, and I pray for everyone to have ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to understand, that they can mix this word with their faith and become profitable for them. I pray, Father, for your anointing on me to deliver this message with the full unction that you've given it to me that people be encouraged and lifted up and their hope be brightened, that their faith be increased in Jesus' name. This passage starts off in the middle here, but it's talking about the three feasts that are required of every Jewish person. And that was Passover, and then the Feast of Weeks, or Feast of Harvest, which was the... Uh, the uh, Shavuot, which we have as the same day as Pentecost, and Pentecost just means 50 in Greek, and it was 50 days from Passover. And so those two feasts, and then Sukkot, which is the feast of ingathering at the end of the year, which is tab when tabernacles occurs, which is now, it starts today. And so this is talking about how that it's a mandate that on the feast of ingathering, which is Feast of Ingathering and Tabernacles, Booths, Sukkot. Those are all names for this, uh, this feast week that's coming up, starting today. And so this is recorded in a number of different places. Agriculturally, it's recorded in uh, Exodus 23, 16, we just read. We're going to read Exodus 34, 22. And then the spiritual side of things is recorded in Leviticus. We'll get into that. It's also in Numbers, Deuteronomy, Ezra, Nehemiah. We're not going to go that far, but I want you to at least get a small snippet of the feast itself. But before I do that, I want to talk to you and read to you something. This is from Wikipedia, but it's a little bit of a description about Sukkot, which is the Hebrew name for this holiday. Sukkot is a Torah-commanded holiday celebrated for seven days from the 15th day of the month of Tishri. It is one of the three pilgrimage festivals, and it's uh, the His Israelites were commanded to make a pilgrimage. If you lived outside of the, the nation of Israel, maybe you lived in Egypt or you lived in Syria or you lived in um, what is currently Iraq, you would have to make a pilgrimage to Israel on those three dates to be there. Otherwise, you were cut off from uh, from your uh, history and from your your inheritance in uh, in uh, the Hebrew nation in God's people. Uh, the names used in the Torah are, and it's uh, Chaga Hasif which is Festival of Ingathering or fest Harvest Festival. Shag uh, Sukkot, translated as Festival of Booths. It's also uh, Festival of Tabernacles. And the, uh, let's say, Exodus 16, or 23 and Exodus 34 talks about the agricultural and the religious significance talked about in the book of Leviticus. So this is the Exodus 34, verse 22. And you shall observe the Feast of Weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest. Now that is Shavuot, which is uh, was in May this year, which is the, uh, uh, the time that the Torah was given when Moses went on Mount Sinai. It's also the time that the Holy Spirit was poured out on believers on Pentecost the same day. Said, you shall observe the feast of the weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. And so this is the uh, the harvest time, and now there's a week of feasting. I don't know if you can see these pictures very well, but 
this up here is a, a, a type of a booth. Usually it's at least three sides and the roof is not a, a roof. They would cover it with uh, branches of trees. And people, families would live in these and they still do to this day. They'll set up it in their backyard. They'll set up on their uh, balconies. If they live in apartments, they'll set up on the balcony. And they actually live out there eating and sleeping out there in this booth, in this tabernacle. The uh, area, this area here are the, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit, but it's the called the three species, the fruit of the tree and the willow and uh, and the uh, branches of the tree and the, the um, I forget what the other is. There's, yeah, we'll, we'll get to it. And then the other picture over here is a couple of Jewish men walking with the branches and the fruit. And they would wave these in exuberant joy throughout the week. Anytime they were out going to the temple or uh, going to the synagogue, they would wave these and they would be excited. It's a week of rejoicing. So Leviticus 23, 34 through 43 gives us these religious implications. Still, I'm still building on, on what Tabernacles is, so it makes sense to us when I get to the next part. So bear with me. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall offer an offering made of fire to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. These are the feasts of the Lord which you shall proclaim be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering and a grain offering, a sacrifice and a drink offering, everything on its day. Besides the Sabbath of the Lord, these your gifts, bestow, beside all your vows, and beside all your free will offerings which you give to the Lord, also on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you gather in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day there shall be a Sabbath rest, on the eighth day a Sabbath rest, and you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. You know, this is the what they call the three species. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a sta statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths that their ge your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And so God in this passage given to Moses actually wrote it twice that you have a first day and an eighth day that are holy convocations. No work being done on those days. And every day you have to take a sacrifice. There's a lot more that happened and a lot more that uh, we'll get into here in a little bit about that. But it was a command to be there and to be a part of this and, and the way that you would do this. So they would build booths, like I said, some on the roof of their house, some on the, the back deck, and they still do today. I have friends of uh, Jewish heritage, and just a couple of years ago, they were showing me pictures of the tabernacle that their son made out on their back deck, and he fully did what he was supposed to do, lived, ate, slept out there in that tabernacle. It's not a, a religious thing as much as it's a reminder, and even in the passage here, it's, it's a reminder of the children of Israel that came out of uh, the out of Egypt. They lived in these kind of things all throughout the wilderness. They lived in tents, lived in booths. But there's also it's an eternal. It's not it's not a feast that will end, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Why it is going to be perpetual but there's also a record of Jesus and this feast in the New Testament so 
I'm going to go to John chapter 7, starting in verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now, Judea is what we would think of like a county. It's a huge area with many cities. And Jerusalem is in Judea. Galilee is in the northern area. And so he was away from the religious right in that area. So he, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand, and his brother, his brother said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Now, see, Jesus did have brothers, and he had at least one sister. We know one of the brothers' name is James, and the other is uh, called Jose, but it was actually, um, uh, it was a different name, uh, Judas, I believe it was, but didn't, nobody wanted to be called Judas after it. Judas Iscariot did what he did. But they didn't believe in Jesus while he was alive. How many times do siblings not believe what you, what you were able to accomplish? Look back to um, Joshua and his brothers. They didn't believe that he was going to be something special. Matter of fact, they sold him into slavery, took his coat, put blood on it, and told their dad that he'd been killed by an animal. Nobody, nobody even, uh, none of the brothers even thought that their brother was going to be something. But you read the rest of the book, you find out that he saved not only his father and his brothers, all of Israel at the time, but also the world, many different countries were able to come and buy grain because of his wisdom and what he did. And so he did become something. And we know Jesus already was something, but his brothers didn't believe him. Then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that it is e its works are evil. You go up to the feast, I'm not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. And something I want to mention is Jesus would have, Jesus, if Jesus had stayed away from the feast completely, he would have sinned because it was a command of Almighty God that every Israelite go to the feast of tabernacles not just be in the land but go and participate and so if Jesus had stayed away he could not have been our Savior he didn't go with his brothers because his brothers were challenging him saying yeah uh -huh, you're all this you're a box of crackers and all that well go show them what you are don't just talk about it don't just stay up here but go down there where they can judge you when they can see that you are who you say you are. They weren't believing in him. They weren't encouraging him. They were chiding him. And he said the best thing he could say to get them on their way. And then we'll see here in later in the same chapter that he did go. Before I go into that portion, I want to talk about one of the uh, things that happened every day during the feast. Think of this, the temple was up on a hill and there was roadways down. One roadway down from one of the gates went down to the Pool of Siloam. Many of you may have read or heard the stories of uh, the person that was uh, a beggar or blind, another that was uh, paralytic, and people that would lie around that. And when the angels would trouble the waters, the first one in would be healed. The Pool of Siloam, was where uh, travelers that were going up to the Temple Mount would do a mikvah. They would come and they would cleanse themselves before going on the Temple Mount. You could not go any other way. And you could not go past this pool without doing a mikvah to go on up. So you didn't just go through a haphazard, hey, go in the gate. You had to come around this way. So it's a prescribed way to show that you had been cleansed before going into the house of God. Uh, the priests 
would come down, and because this was free flowing from the Gihon Springs, because free flowing water, it was water that could be used for that purpose. It was also considered sacred in that it was a, um, they would come down with a golden pitcher and they would fill up the pitcher and then in a procession walk back up to the, uh, the temple and pour it onto a portion of the altar as a water offering, water libation. And they did this all seven days. But the way they did it on this seventh day is the, the phalanx of priests would come down to the water and they would say some prayers and things and the high priest would dip the water into the golden pitcher and then the priest would all turn around and they were all carrying 20 to 30 or 40 foot tall palm fronds and they were walk, they'd walk in ranks and so they would step in unison and you can imagine these palm fronds as they flowed back and forth heading up the hill. These weren't little things, these were huge. And as they walked, there was the swishing of these. And it wasn't just two or three, it was a whole phalanx of them. And they would walk up and he carried this pitcher. Well, coming from the other way through a different gate was a whole other procession of priests bringing wine. And they would all get to the, their respective gates to the temple at the same time. And when they got there, there was, uh, they would wait at the gate and they would not come in until this uh, one person would start playing a flute, a certain song on a flute. And they called the flutist, the flautist, the pierced one because the flute has holes pierced in it. It was the pierced one. And so these priests would come in with those palm fronds and they would circle the uh, the brazen altar seven times. Then they would lay their palm fronds against the four sides of that. So it almost is like the, the brazen altar now is in a booth. It has all these palm fronds leaning against it. And the priests would take the oil and the water and would walk up the ramp onto the altar and then where they would pour this is there was there were two bowls as it was called and those bowls had a funnel end to it and they were affixed to the side of the altar where the, the burnt sacrifices were made it was affixed to the side and the pipes went down to below the um, the altar so what was poured in there would run out down into the, the ash area and down in the bottom and what the priest would do, he'd raise his arms up, out, even, and then start pouring. You can't see my hands. Let me see. He'd start pouring both of them at the same time into those respective receptacles. Now, the volume or the, the funnel portion of these were designed in such a way that the viscosity of water being different than the viscosity of the wine one would flow faster than the other. And so they had one that was a little more restricted so that as they poured it in, it would fill the bowl up and they would keep pouring at the same rate that it was going down and that they would both flow out together at the same rate so that both bowls emptied, when they were done pouring, both bowls emptied at the same time. They did this as part of the, uh, called the wine and water libation. And this had to be done. It was done only on the, the seventh day. Now, there's significance to that that I'm hoping that you can get with me here in a second. But I want to talk to you about what Jesus did that proved he was at this feast. He didn't just stay back in Galilee. And that's here in uh, verse, starting with verse 37. On the last day, the last day of the feast, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood out and cried. He was in the temple, cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I want to pause here 
as this water libation was going on and everybody was watching it, Jesus called out this. One of the things being done on this last day is the prayers that are going to be made for this on this day is for seven years of good rains for good crops through the next seven years. Each year they were praying for good rain for the next seven years. And so on their heart and minds was praying about this rain so they could have good harvest, they thanking God for the harvest they had, and that God's the giver of this water that that helps sustain them. And Jesus cried out and says, I am. I am the living water. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures said, out of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Therefore, Many from the crowd, when they heard the saying, said, Truly, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Will Christ come out of Galilee? And so this was not something that usually happened at this time. He called out, and everybody was affected one way or another. Everybody made a choice. This is the Christ. Or is this the prophet that's going to come at the last days? And others said, Nah, it can't be. Now I want to share how this relates to Christ physically and to us. Again, in John chapter 19 this time, starting with verse 32. When the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he's telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Jesus became the pierced one at this moment. Jesus also had blood and water, symbolic of the wine and water, pouring out together down across him to the base of the cross. For 1,500 some years, the Jews had been doing this water and wine libation every year on the Feast of Tabernacles, the last day they would do this. And it points to the significance that Christ, when he gave, made the ultimate sacrifice, blood and water came out of him to signify what had been a dress rehearsal all these years. Now, this wasn't a Jewish soldier that did this. This was a Roman soldier, a total unbeliever. He helped fulfill scripture just because God had said it was going to happen. So you're seeing here that God can use an unbeliever. He can use circumstances outside somebody else's control. To make his word come true. Jesus is our sacrifice. He is our, our ever-present help in time of need. And what he did on the cross signified and was culminated and practiced as a dress rehearsal, as this part of the dress rehearsal through all of this uh, Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles was historic looking forward and it's historic looking backwards. But it's also prophetic because we, re we read in the Word how that when the thousand year reign is set up, after Christ comes back and sets his foot on the Mount of Olives and it splits apart, and that the thousand year reign begins with his kingdom here. And those of us who are saved are sealed and in that and we will rule and reign with him but during that thousand years every year at the feast of tabernacles every nation has to send their tithe and should are supposed to come to the feast of tabernacles any nation who does not their reign is held off 
and they could have drought or even famine because they are not doing what they're supposed to do. For a thousand years, this will continue, this, this uh, Feast of Tabernacles. The whole thousand years is considered a, the, a tabernacling among men, that Jesus will be on this earth and we will be here ruling and reigning with him for that thousand years. And it's the tabernacling of God among men. And so it's forward-looking to what's going to happen. It's backward-looking historically to what did happen, and then it points to Jesus on the cross and what he did. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's a joyous thing to know what he did and how he set you free. John chapter, John chapter 1, verse 14. John the Beloved, he got it. He got this, he, he, he understood what was in the Old Testament and what Jesus had, had fulfilled. In John 1.14, he says, And the Word became flesh. The Word talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. That's John 1.1. 1, 1. In verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. In the phrase, dwelt among us, is also the Greek word, tabernacled among us, or tabernacled with us. The word became flesh and tabernacled with us. And Jesus came and out of heaven and dwelt in a human body as a man laid aside all of his glory much like leaving your home with all of its its nice accoutrements and living in a tent for seven days living in a tent for a while you're roughing it it's not the same jesus tabernacled among us when he was here on this earth and he will tabernacle amongst us again when he rules and reigns my question to you the Old Testament, the New Testament, all point to Christ. All point to Jesus as being the way to God. That Jesus did it all. Even the, the feasts and the, the ceremonies from Passover to First Fruits to um, Shavuot, Pentecost, to Rosh Hashanah, to Yom Kippur, even to Sukkot, Tabernacles. Each of these feasts and festivals point to Christ Jesus being the Messiah. The word Christ is Greek meaning anointed one and Hebrew Messiah meaning anointed one. And so when you're saying Jesus Christ, you're saying Jesus the anointed one. We're saying Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, you're saying Jesus the anointed one. And so it's the one and the same. It's just we like to think that Christ is his last name. It's not. It's his title. He's, a, he's the anointed one. Why? Because he fulfilled what God sent him to do for you and for me to buy us back so that we could have everlasting life with him. That's why John 3.16 3, says that gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's why we're not under condemnation but we're in salvation. It's because of what Christ did. And these feasts, even though we as Christians don't celebrate these feasts, it's nice knowing about them and knowing what they mean and how they fit into what we do believe and what God does say. And what God was pointing to that the, the Jewish nation, most of them, still have not understood. And one day they will. The Word says that they will. In a day they will be saved and they will recognize their Messiah. This Jewish friend of mine, when he talks to other Jewish people and they're talking about, are you looking for the Messiah? And they're saying, yes. He says, you know what I'm going to say when I see him? They go, no, what's that? Have you been here before? And they say, you know, that's profound. Because they know about the story of Jesus, but they can't see how Jesus could be the Messiah because their minds are blinded. And he uses that as a witnessing tool. Then he talks to them about this Messiah and how this Messiah changed his life, this Christ. But have you been here before? And you'll say, yes, I have. I died on a cross outside that city, and I died for you. Well, Jesus is giving each of us an opportunity to make this right for ourselves today.
to not wait for some time and hope that we make it in. Yom Kippur, which finished just uh, five days ago, Yom Kippur was the Day of Atonement, and on that date, historically, when they would go through and do all that, that date, if your name was not written in the Book of Life, that book was closed, and you had to wait till next year for Rosh Hashanah for the books to be opened, for your name to be written again, and it was a time of repentance. So that's closed, and now it's harvest, and now it's rejoicing that we are there. And it's a picture of our, our ruling and reigning with him, a picture of our time in heaven after we depart here but let's make it right now with Jesus if you haven't already because now is the day of salvation Romans 10 9 and 10 tells that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord you will be saved you can do that right now if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior I encourage you to make it right I encourage you to to pray with me and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to come in and cleanse you and to take all those sins away, to take your filthy rags of righteousness away and to restore you with his righteousness. That's what he says. Well, I'm going to pray a prayer, and as I do, I just ask you, if you believe in your heart, not just your head, believe in your heart, say this with me, and God will hear your prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, I realize that I'm a sinner. I realize I can't make it to you on my own. I realize that Jesus came and lived and died for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe that you raised him from the dead. And I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, let me know one way or another. I pray it a lot even now, only because it reminds me of what I did many years ago. And I, I make mistakes. I need to ask forgiveness. And I use this prayer as a way to take care of that. I know Jesus died once for all, that I'm already saved, but it doesn't hurt to remind myself of what he did. And that's kind of what Tabernacles this whole week is about, is to remind yourself what Jesus did on the cross, how he fulfilled that, and he says that he will bring forth from you, if you believe in him and you accept him, he will bring forth from you rivers of living waters. There's blessing in knowing Jesus. Our benediction is in Hebrew and in English. Let's see if I can get this up elevated because I need it higher. It's in Hebrew and in English. And God said to, Ab to Moses when he gave this to, Ab to, to Aaron that when this is said over the people, God says he will put his name on the people. So let God put his name on you double because this is in Hebrew and then in English. This is November, uh, Numbers 6. 24 Shalom. For those of you that are seeing this on Facebook today on October the 9th, I also posted a YouTube video that I found about Tabernacles. It goes into more depth. It shows you more about it uh, in my Facebook. So if you're interested in that, go back and look at that. It gives you a little more. But the main point is that these feasts all pointed to Christ. They all pointed to what he was going to do. And they will 
perpetually throughout the eons of eternity point back to what he did. So it's good to know about them. It's good to know what God did historically as a remembrance because we're honoring him when we follow through with just, hey, I know what you did and I see you painted in all of this grandeur. God bless. Pastor Jeff Fairley with Faith and Grace Fellowship. See you again next week.